this bill. The question is that this bill be now read a second time, and I call the honourable member for Swan. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise to support the bill and the Australian Citizenship Amendment into Country Adoption Bill 2014. And uh, I thank the member for Isaacs for his contribution, and uh, I uh, acknowledge his bipartisan support for the amendments. Uh, just to demonstrate a personal interest in this legislation, as most people in this place would know, I was. Um, uh, a foster child and grew up in Melbourne and had, two, uh, had a, f a brother who was adopted out at a very young age who I never met until recently, two years ago, when he, just after he turned 51. So uh, adoption has its place in Australia, has a long history in Australia, and I know that growing up in, uh, at a particular time, uh, adoption had a certain stigma about it, and uh, fostering didn't, but uh, adoption did. And I know in the same street that I lived in there was a uh, young lad and his sister who were adopted, but uh, no one knew about it until years later because no one talked about it. It was a, uh, where the fostering was seen to be an acceptable thing. Adoption was often uh, seen as a stigma for people who had actually adopted and had to admit that they couldn't have kids or um, to hide the fact that the kids weren't actually didn't belong to those people who they were adopted by biologically. There was still a stigma within um, probably the area, the middle class area I grew up in in Box Hill um, in Victoria many years ago. The circumstances of fostering or adoption are, are often ones that, or are ones that children don't have any say in. And uh, uh, I know with mine, it was a decision by the state to remove three of the children from the, the family home at, uh, without any notification or, or any uh, long-time thing. And the reason for that was my father, who happened to be uh, a painter and docker, was um, uh, not paying his maintenance. His maintenance was two pound a week, and he refused to pay it. So he went to jail for that. And at the, at the end of the time, the state said, well, uh, my mother didn't have any uh, level of su uh, income to support the six children she had at that particular time, so they decided to take the three youngest children. I was at about uh, 10 months of age and put into a baby's institution, and then uh, my two other older siblings were put into uh, children's homes. Um, they both passed on, but then the number seven was born, and he was uh, adopted out at, at an early age as well. So. There are all different uh, reasons for adoption. I support adoptions. I think it's a, it's a great idea, for, particularly for people who uh, can't have children. And um, mm -hmm. also, it's, uh, and fostering is a, an option in Australia as well. So I'll, I'll actually, uh, part of the thing I'll speak about, I want to give a bit of a background and talk about the Royal Commission, how that uh, was affected from people from my time as well, and then I'll move into the uh, areas of the bill. But, Madam Speaker, there are echoes of the past in this legislation that can't be ignored. Overseas child migration is certainly not a new issue confronting uh, this parliament. As the National Archives records show, in the years following World War II, a popular immigration slogan was, the child, the best immigrant. The powers at the time believed that child migrants could assimilate more easily, were more adaptable and had a long working life ahead, and could be cheaply housed in a dormitory-style accommodation. Between 1947 and 1953, over 3,000 child migrants entered Australia under schemes approved in this place. All apart from 100 Maltese children came from the UK. Other European countries were asked to participate in the scheme but declined. The children were adopted by institution houses in 30 homes across Australia approved by the Commonwealth, mostly run by voluntary and religious organisations. Two of these homes are in my electorate of Swan at Castle Dare in Wilson and Clontarf in Waterford. While it was not Commonwealth policy to provide these homes specifically for migrant children, the Commonwealth did contribute to the capital expenditure and operational and running costs of the home, so the Commonwealth was certainly involved in these decisions and this policy. What happened in the homes and what happened to these child migrants across the country is now being fully explored by the Royal Commission into institutional responses to child sex abuse. A couple of months ago uh, or so ago in Perth, the Royal Commission took evidence from former child migrants who had been placed at the two Christian Brothers institutions at Waterford and Wilson in my electorate of Swan. The Commission took evidence about the systematic sexual abuse that took place at these homes under the Christian Brothers at this time and the failure of the Christian Brothers and other institutions to stop the abuse. Madam Speaker, this went on for years without being reported and only now is the true picture beginning to emerge. The Royal Commission has been necessary and good, and in many ways it, was really, it really came out of the national apology to the forgotten Australians on the 16th of November 2009. 
It took that moment in 2009 of recognition of what happened to spur the investigation that is now occurring through the Royal Commission. I know when uh, the Leader of the Opposition at the time said, uh, we believe you, that moment you could sense the relief and the jubilation in the crowd because up until that point no one had believed them. It is absolutely essential that the truth comes out in this Royal Commission, not only for the former child migrants themselves today, but also to be able to identify the risks in the future. And that brings me to an overseas adoption bill today. Good statistics are collected by the Australian Government on adoption, and there is some very interesting research in the latest available report that was conducted by the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. I'll refer to some of these and quote some of the research here as it does shine a light on the adoption processes in Australia and some elements that members must consider when debating this legislation. Adoptions have fallen steadily in Australia from 1501 in 1998-99 to 339 in 2012-13. Madam Speaker, that's a 77 per cent decline. Mm. Of the 339 adoptions, 129 were inter-country adoptions and 210 or 62 per cent were Australian adoptions. Of the Australian adoptions, only 54 were local adoptions, with the other 156 classified as known child adoptions, i.e. a step-parent, a relative or a carer of that particular child. Of the inter-country adoptions, there was a fairly even split between those from Hague countries or, or, or those countries who had signed up to the, um, the Hague Convention and those from non-signatory countries. The Institute of Health and Welfare's report notes that adopted children, especially those adopted from overseas, are likely to have been in institutional care for a portion of their lives and that the quality of institutional care and the length of time spent in this environment can affect a child's adjustment after adoption and the likelihood they will experience developmental delays. It goes on to note that children who are adopted from overseas typically have received only a basic level of care during their stay in an institution with the possibility of exposure to toxins and the existence of nutritional deficiencies, which means as a result these children are at increased risk of health problems such as infectious diseases, growth and developmental delays and emotional disorders. Research suggests that the children most at risk of unsuccessful outcomes include those adopted at an older age, those with a history of physical abuse, deprivation and neglect, and those with a history of sexual abuse with, will develop with emotional and behavioural problems. Madam Speaker, there are no orphanages or institutions any longer in Australia. There is actually no need for institutions as there is a greater demand for adoptions in Australia than there are potential adoptees. This makes adoptions from overseas institutions attractive to prospective parents. But given the history of abuse in Australian institutions, we have a responsibility to proceed cautiously and ensure that we have learnt from that history. I note the Prime Minister said in his speech that we do not want to repeat the mistakes of the past. There should be regular checks and inspections at these institutions if the Australian Government is going to authorise early adoptions from them. I have met with the Prime Minister and his office and have been assured there will be absolute scrutiny to ensure the integrity of these reforms. There might be no issues with adopting babies, but we must look at the institution as a whole and ensure that the welfare needs of the older children particularly are met. If the, institution, if the Institute of Health and Welfare is highlighting issues of poor child welfare in these institutions, we need to be absolutely sure that such institutions are run genuinely and the Australian adoption is not some sort of business model. The Hague Adoption Convention was brought in to provide protections from child laundering and child trafficking, but not all countries have signed it. And in 2012-13, of the 129 inter-country inter adoptions to Australia, 68 were from non-signatory countries. It sounds blunt, but there is a demand. If there is a demand, someone will fill the supply. And we need to make absolutely sure that by seeming to do a good deed for children, like many, I'm sure, argued post-war the child, war, child migration program would do, we are not in fact creating many more problems that we cannot see. And in this, Madam Speaker, we must remember what is sometimes forgotten, the foster care system in Australia as well. There were 339 adoptions in Australia, as I stated, but we know there are many more children that require foster care each year. Although this is not specifically an element of this bill, and foster caring tends to be a state government responsibility, we do need to keep it in mind for if there is a five-year waiting list for overseas adoptions, 
maybe we need to be stressing the benefits of foster caring more. I know that the state government runs campaigns from time to time to encourage people to step forward as foster carers, and we certainly always do need good foster carers to do that. We must also acknowledge the important role that grandparents play in foster care. There is a growing tendency for children to stay with their families and often with their grandparents when a child needs care beyond the biological parents, which was not necessarily the case in the past. This will also have contributed to lower adoption rates and the closure of institutions in Australia. Madam Speaker, I acknowledge the personal interest of the Prime Minister in this legislation. I acknowledge that he has spent time talking to families in Australia that are looking to adopt but are finding the system too complex. I acknowledge the role the Prime Minister took in the apology also to the forgotten Australians on the 16th of November 2009 when he was the Coalition's spokesperson on social affairs. Madam Speaker, the intent of this bill is to amend the Australian Citizenship Act 2007 to enable children adopted overseas by Australian citizens and the bilateral inter-country adoption arrangements, where the adoption is a full adoption to apply for and be granted Australian citizenship in, the country of, in their country of origin. At present, Australia has bilateral adoption programs with Taiwan and South Korea, so these are countries we are talking about here, but there may of course be other bilateral arrangements in the future. Presently, with some administrative complexity surrounding overseas adoption essentially involving the visa requirements of bringing the adopted children into Australia for the first time. Currently, children adopted under bilateral arrangements require a passport from the country they are being adopted from and a valid visa to Australia. This certainly has been causing some delays and administrative hurdles, particularly given the child, the children being adopted, the child being adopted is very unlikely to have a passport for, from that country. These would be the same arrangements which would apply to countries that have signed the Hague Agreement. The government's position is that if a country is first, that if a country is first willing to participate in an inter-country adoption arrangement, and second, will meet the standards and safeguards equivalent to those required under the Hague Convention, then it should be treated as a Hague Convention country for the purpose of overseas adoption. Some countries in Asia have not signed the Hague Convention due to concerns around provisions relating to inter-country marriages, which is a separate issue to inter-country adoption. Nonetheless, I'm particularly keen to see that there is utmost scrutiny and control of this process for the non-signing countries if we are going to proceed down this path. I note the Prime Minister said in his speech that under legislation, an application can only be approved if the adoption has been finalised in the overseas country and an adoption's compliance certificate issued by the authorities of that country. He said that the adoption must also have the effect of terminating the legal relationship between the child and his or her previous parents. Further to this, the Prime Minister said that the Minister retains the discretion to refuse an application which meets the requirements which would be relevant if fraud or some other irregularity came to light or concerns about the identity of the child are raised before the citizenship is granted. I support this intent but again raise this point with the Prime Minister and his office and I'm confident that there are enough investigative avenues on the ground in these countries in which we have bilateral agreements with and processes in place to ensure the integrity of the system to refuse applications when needed. So I think the Prime Minister is correct when he says that this is not, this, he is not pretending everything will be simple and straightforward immediately. We need to take incredibly careful steps in this area. Madam Speaker, I acknowledge that there is bipartisan support for this bill and that the legislation will pass this chamber and head to the Senate. I acknowledge the good intentions of those on both sides of the House when it comes to inter-country adoption. But many times in the past, good intentions have not produced the right result for the adoptees. So in the context, I urge caution in the implementation of this legislation and the processes to ensure the best outcomes for all involved and Australia as a nation. I commend the bill to the House.